Hello, my name is Karen Oberhauser and I'm the director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arboretum. I'm also a conservation biologist and have been studying one of North America's most charismatic butterflies, the monarch butterfly, for the past 35 years. The engagement of students, teachers, and other people in my research has been incredibly important. Today, I'm thrilled to be sharing some of what I've learned about urban biodiversity and citizen science. But first, I'd like to thank the Korean National Arboretum for hosting this International Garden Symposium and for inviting me to be a part of it. It's an honor to be speaking to you today, and I wish that we could be together in person. We all know that the world is experiencing a depressing and accelerating rate of biodiversity loss. It's important to understand that we as humans are the main drivers of these losses. It's also important to understand that conservation needs to be integrated with everything that we do and to work to reverse the impacts of our activities. Many people think of urban areas, such as what we see in this image of Sao Paulo, Brazil, as biodiversity dead zones, areas that we concentrate people into while working to conserve more pristine areas without people in them. We think of cities as places in which natural habitats are completely replaced with artificial ones. But for most of human history, most people lived in rural areas. This graph shows the total human population with the green line that starts out on the bottom representing the number of people in urban areas and the black line representing the number in rural areas. But we passed an important landmark in 2006, when for the first time in human history, more people lived in urban areas than rural ones. Right now, one out of five of us lives in a city of over a million people. By 2030, the UN predicts that there will be 41 cities with over 10 million people, so-called megacities. This map shows you the location of these cities, which are spread throughout the world. With so many of us living in cities, and with cities taking up more and more land, we need to think about urban conservation in different ways. We can manage land in ways that provides a home for plants and animals, as well as people. Well-planned green spaces of all sizes can support both year-long residents and birds and insects that move through these spaces on annual migratory flights. Urban green spaces can provide places for people to connect to the natural world, thus making us better global citizens. At the same time, we benefit. Spending time in green spaces improves our physical and emotional health. The University of Wisconsin-Madison Arboretum is one example of an urban green space. On almost 500 hectares of land that was both purchased by and donated to the University of Wisconsin in the 1930s to 1950s, native plants and animals thrive. The Arboretum is the home of the first restored prairie in the world, large expanses of restored woodlands and savannas, a horticultural garden that hosts over 6,000 trees and shrubs, and a large native plant garden near our visitor center. This land also provides a place of respite and learning for people from around the world. Our 26 full-time staff care for this land, study the best ways to protect and preserve it, and educate others about the natural world and our connections to it. But our staff can't do all of this alone, and hundreds of volunteers are involved in all aspects of our work. Today, we'd like to share a bit about the work of one group of volunteers, citizen scientists. Citizen science or community science is the practice of public participation and collaboration in scientific research. Citizen scientists are usually volunteers. At the Arboretum, these volunteers collect data on many plants and animals, helping us understand what habitats best support urban species and how we can manage our land to support more species. At the same time, they are forming stronger connections between themselves and the natural world and sharing what they learn with others. Let's meet some of our citizen scientists volunteers. My name is Judy Cardine and I volunteer at the UW Arboretum. I retired a couple of years ago from state government. I've always loved gardening and I've always been interested in insects because of gardening, but I never really thought a lot about bumblebees until I went to a training presentation that Susan Carpenter put on who's the native plant gardener here at UW Arboretum. And she opened my eyes to 
the relationship between native plants and bumblebees. And I thought, I really want to get more involved in this, see what I can do to help, considering that bumblebees are having problems right now and their populations are declining. What I've really learned from bumblebees is a lot about the, the interdependence that everybody has. What, the interdependence we have with the bees and with other life forms. And I began to understand that as a gardener, I shouldn't just be looking at how can I make my garden conform to what I want it to look like. I, I understood now that I need to garden so that I'm part of that whole. In working with the bumblebees, I began to understand that having those floral resources throughout the life of the nest is critical. From early spring in April when the queens start coming out until October when the last males are, are still flying, there has to be food for them in order to live. I learned from Susan Carpenter that there is a citizen science program, the Wisconsin Bumblebee Brigade, that the Department of Natural Resources monitors, and I decided to become a part of that. When I'm doing that, I'm taking photographs of bumblebees while I'm out by the flowers, and then I submit those photos to the Department of Natural Resources, and that helps them determine what's going on with the populations, what kind of habitat do the bumblebees need, what kind of wintering habitat do the bumblebees need, and just overall allows the, the resources of the state government to be better directed at protecting bumblebees. I understand now how important it is to have native plants, to have green space, to have a place in urban areas where bumblebees and other insects are, are able to flourish. The UW Arboretum has been a big part of my life. It's been a big part of my children's lives because we wanted to be in touch with nature even though we're living in the city. We wanted to see those natural communities and how they interact with each other. And, and this space here at the UW Arboretum is the jewel that we've always called it that's allowed us to do that. In addition, I, I realized that we need to have, we need to have places all over the city. Um, in, in neighborhoods, we need to have places. Um, I've turned a good sh portion of my front yard into a native plant garden because we need to have that. My name is Martha Askins, and I am a mostly retired criminal defense attorney. This is my second year doing monarch monitoring. Um, I do it because, well, a few reasons. One is I like to think that it contributes to society now that I've retired it's important to me to do something that's of value to the world. And um, my hope is that citizen science and that my monarch monitoring is a small contribution to that. So that's one reason. Another reason that I do it is I love being outside um, and it gives me a, an opportunity to be outside and to do something and also actually to learn something new. I really didn't know anything about monarchs um, when I started this. I did the training here at the Arboretum for how to do monarch uh, larva observation and how to enter the data. And so when I started this, I would not have been able to find, much less identify a monarch larva. So it's kind of cool to me that I can look at milkweed and I can look for larva or eggs and then identify that it's a monarch larva and then identify what stage it might be at. In monarch monitoring, we look at individual or this particular protocol, we look at individual uh, milkweed plants and that involves examining the leaves of those plants, one plant at a time. And I've never done anything like that before, that level of close observation of a plant. There's sort of a 
zen quality to it, you just slow, you have to slow down. You go one plant at a time, you know, you're entering your information on your piece of paper. And the things you see when you look at one leaf at a time are pretty incredible. I mean, obviously we're looking for monarch evidence, but you see other interesting bugs. I have learned the power of camouflage firsthand. I mean, I, I now see things that you, you try to take a picture of it and it's invisible because these other insects and my favorite are the tree frogs. They just completely are invisible on these plants unless you are looking very closely. It's been a huge gift to be able to really slow down and just do something that is peaceful and um, deliberate and it's, it's really kind of meditative. Since I've been doing the monarch monitoring, I've been spending more time here at the Arboretum and at a park close to my house. And it's been actually super important to me. And, and a, you know, a couple of world events or life events have added to that one, of course, being my retirement. So I was looking for something else to do um, and now with the pandemic. So being outside in nature has just been huge for both those things. Citizen scientists have generated an incredible wealth of knowledge. As a professional scientist, I've been studying monarch butterflies for almost 35 years. But without the investment of time by thousands of citizen scientists volunteers, we wouldn't know what we do about monarchs annual migratory cycle how their numbers fluctuate from year to year, and why their populations are in decline. We're learning what monarchs need to flourish and how we can ensure that these needs are met. And we're learning similar things about bees, birds, frogs, snakes, endangered plants, and so many other species. But people's involvement with citizen science has resulted in many more benefits. Citizen scientists, like those you met here today, increase their engagement with many other conservation actions. They minimize the use of harmful chemicals in their gardens, educate their friends and neighbors, and work to preserve habitat. And they learn a lot and have fun in the meantime. Citizen science helps us understand that people and the natural world can exist side by side, even in large urban areas. It's up to all of us to ensure that natural spaces and the opportunities to learn and benefit from them are here for future generations. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the symposium.